Melissa, welcome to Below the Bout podcast. How are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. I'm very well. Let's jump straight into it. Tell us a bit about yourself, your journey into sports psychiatry. Yeah, so my journey started in tennis Mm -hmm. as a player first, competing at a very young age. Um, I started at the age of seven. Oh, very young then. Yeah, very young. um, And then I started to compete at the age of 12 growing Mm -hmm. up. Was it something from a young age you wanted to take seriously? Uh, you mean psychology? Or uh, or? No, tennis. Oh, tennis. Oh, sorry. You said you started psychology. No, or I tennis? didn't. No, I meant tennis. <laughs> tennis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, tennis. Um, yeah. I think uh, it started to become serious when I became 12. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't something that I think I was thinking about when I was young. Mm-hmm. I was just enjoying mm-hmm. it, being in the moment, free, enjoying the sport. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you're around other yeah, yeah, yeah. kids and then you see them competing. Yeah, and then yeah. my parents wanted mm-hmm. me to be competing mm-hmm. as well. Um, so the road of becoming where I, where I am right now and going into psychology mm-hmm. all began from my experiences mm-hmm. playing uh, and competing oh, okay. as, as a junior. When I was younger, a lot of my performance concerns and issues that I had was dealing with pressure. Okay. And that came from the back of competing and, and playing with girls that are older than me, younger yeah. than me, around the world. So that means you must have competed at a good level then to start feeling that pressure, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was all, yeah, yeah. there was a lot mm-hmm. of like county, regional, mm. national players that I was competing yeah, with yeah, at a very yeah. young age. Mm. Um, and it was dealing with pressure at that time that affected my confidence when mm-hmm. I was young. And that's what I was dealing with when I was mm. younger. And then I had a particular coach, mm. like Mm-hmm. midway in my teens mm-hmm. who really honed in on working on my psychology of the game okay. mm-hmm. my identity on and off the court were you always naturally a confident person would you say though or was it something that came naturally being confident or i don't think so i think is it grown over time is something is a skill that grows and develops yeah, yeah, over yeah. time okay uh, and that took me time to mm. understand that as a player and as a mm-hmm. person so i remember um, you used to make me understand pressure by educating me on how the elites take the pressure mm-hmm. and how they define pressure. Mm-hmm. And I remember him talking not just about the elites in tennis, football, boxing, other sports, mm. and understand how mm-hmm. they see pressure and how they perceive it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of my learning and education was looking at role models Mm -hmm. working with that understanding pressure so did you use kind of elite athletes as a way in which to learn right with their habits and the way that they do things the way they mentally prepare from that standpoint that was one way and also another way was um becoming very process orientated yeah so focusing on the process of my game Mm. what we're trying to achieve today Mm. and um really clear really simple goals mm. to keep me in the present moment and then mm. that helped a lot actually just to overcome so adding that structure then in, in a way right because i think sometimes if you don't have that structure or anything to work towards it can get a little bit you don't know what you're not you don't know what you're doing but you don't have those clear guidelines right how can you get to where you need to be no, i guess and, and i agree and i think it's uh what you're focusing on is yeah. really important as well. Mm. Uh, from my experiences working with athletes now, a lot of them will be result driven. It's mm-hmm. all about the win, the mm-hmm. trophy, or the end, yeah, yeah, end yeah. desired, the end desired goal. Is that the right way to be? Do you think? Well, what it does is it creates a lot of pressure on themselves, and yeah, there's yeah, a huge yeah. amount of expectations there. Yeah. Um, the uh, the uh, as much noise that you're going to get out from the outside and as much as high performance is and the sport is Mm. very much result orientated you have to be result orientated Mm. to be present yeah and to be clear to have clarity Mm. and focusing on well what am i going to achieve today Mm. what is it that i need to do to that match that i need to achieve from a personal point of view Mm. instead of thinking about the win yeah yeah yeah. okay so was that coach then the catalyst to you being so fascinated with sports psychology and the mind because obviously I saw your CV and I was thinking she's invested a hell of a lot of time and education into following this as a career path and you've got your own business now right which is is it in the zone 
Yes. Yes, I- which so you're fully immersed within within the world of sports psychology and helping kind of elite athletes get to that next level. So is that the point it all started then, the fascination into that world? It actually started later on in my teenage years mm. because I knew that I wanted to go into sports. I was mm. passionate about sports, um, mm-hmm. played it for a long time. I remember I remember I had to choose between tennis and dancing at the age of ah, 13. Okay, yeah. <laughs> There's always, for some reason when you're young and you're, you're a kid that's into sports, there's always two sports that you have to choose from, right? Which one is it? Because it can never, it never can be both. You got to dedicate yourself to one. Exactly. And yeah. I had to make that decision yeah. at the age of thirteen. Mm. I was thinking, right, okay. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember Maria Sharapova mm. being the biggest idol then for me, being the young is seventeen. That your idol? Age. Yeah. She was when yeah. I was at okay. that age. Yeah. Um, she's just won Wimbledon, mm. and she's, you mm. know, I was like, right, tennis is is my mm. thing. So, um, I, uh. Probably continued further on my tennis, mm. played more with the, yeah. played more, trained more in my tennis and the the performing arts side kind of similar. Did you ever want to take it professional then with the uh, with the tennis? Of course. Yeah, yeah definitely. Did yeah. You, so was there a lot? Did you put a lot of pressure on your on your own shoulders or? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it was the pressure was making my parents proud. Yeah, um, they invested a lot of time into this. Was there pressure on the results in terms of, oh, I need to get to here by That's this point age. in time? Was that ever in your mind? Yeah, it was. Yeah? At that time, ha- yes. How did you handle that? Handle that? Do you think looking back, you handled it well? or? Um, I actually can't remember how I handled yeah. it. I think, I think it just fizzled out because I was getting older. I, I think yeah. it was more of a reali- realisation thing that yeah. I'm getting older now. Okay. I don't know when I'm going to go into the tour for Wimbledon and, mm. and when all that would look like. Also, there was a lot of finances that needs to figure out with yeah. tennis because it's an expensive, expensive sport, sport to travel yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Imagine. Um, and it was the moment where I was university or mm. want to play more. Mm-hmm. And the idea of going to Loughborough University was to play there mm. and do mm-hmm. my education too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that was the turning point when I was there. That was what made me really hone into psychology because I was learning a lot about the sports okay. and exercise sciences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything around. Did the fascination just grow from. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can imagine. Uh, and the reason I ask you about how you dealt with the pressure is, I think when I was younger, obviously I used to be an amateur boxer and. I specifically remember a point in time, I must have been about 16 or 17, I put pressure on myself to say, okay, obviously I'd enter national championships, but okay, you have to win it because obviously to win, uh, to get onto the England squad, you have to win the yeah. national championships. But okay, I need to win it this year. If I don't win it this year, I'm another year behind. And I was putting so much pressure on myself. Like It was initially a sport I really enjoyed, but I think for me, I didn't have a strong enough mindset whether that's the right way to phrase it, to deal with that pressure and instead of enjoying the sport and enjoying the competition I think I put unnecessary pressure on myself in a way of which like I can remember instead of worrying about my own ability and how good I could be I was worrying about okay I just need to I just need to win this and I'd be worrying about the opponent and yeah just not dealing with the pressure well in general and now when I look back on it as I'm older and all the things you learn with age I would have handled it so much better if I had the mindset that I had now. So that's why I kind of went, especially in somebody in your boat, who's a sports psychologist, used to be somebody who was on the cusp of play, play, or whether you already were playing kind of professional tennis, like whether you would have handled that better at that point in time with the things that you've learned now. Oh, do you know what? I always think that. I yeah. think the mindset that I have now. Now, oh, if only I had that when I was younger. If I had that when I was younger, yeah, where would yeah. I be in my sport? Yeah. Oh, 100%. I think we all I think we all have that aspect, don't we? When yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We always get mature, we become mm. mentally stronger, we're dealing with more situations, we become more resilient. I think that's why I find it phenomenal when you get these really young athletes who are doing incredible things at such a young age. Like I think even on the football scene, like just in the Euros now, there was a 16-year-old um, playing, obviously played for Spain, who won the European Championships. I'm thinking that 16 years of age, you must have a ridiculous sense of self belief and an obsession with a particular goal or target to mm. be performing that well, right? Mm. So I think no matter what sport you're in, and you tell me, like, that's one of the things that you probably deal with a lot of your athletes, like how to deal with pressure. Mm. Yeah, it's one of the common things mm. because pressure is 
something that you deal with on a daily basis in mm. life and also on top of that high performance and yeah. being in that environment is also pressure mm. for these athletes too yeah and if you don't deal with pressure it turns into stress yeah and when stress builds um mm. then that obviously stop that makes you stop believing in yourself mm. because you haven't dealt with the pressure yeah stress gets higher and higher so what would you have said to somebody who's like a younger me for for example who is putting that pressure on themselves and like okay i'm coming to you for advice melissa you're a sports psychologist i need to win this uh, this championship this year or i need to achieve this goal what would your advice be to somebody like that would it be to step back a second and not get ahead of themselves in some ways i think it's really the first initial chats will be to understand what's happening yeah. where's this pressure coming mm. from why they're thinking like this yeah the root cause the root cause mm. is diving deeper into that um and realizing maybe some of these beliefs are false mm. or lim limiting beliefs mm. um they may be externally focused instead of internally focused mm. which sounds a bit like your situation when you was growing up thinking yeah. about your opponent Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> a bit too much sometimes where I'd lack the self-belief in my own abilities instead. Yeah. And I think just like from the things that you're talking about, like root cause, a lot of that seems like as you get older, something which you could do yourself in a way of self-reflection, right? Yes. Why am I thinking like this? Why am yes. I doing what I'm doing? So I'm guessing that's a big part of, of, yeah. of the psychology, right? Oh, massive part. When mm. you can go to the root causes mm. of dealing with anything whether it's pressure or um what fear or anything that's holding mm. you back when you go to the root of anything that's the biggest thing that can change a lot of things because what you're doing there mm. is you're changing someone's belief systems and perceptions mm. yeah on something that's holding them back mm. and when you can go into that that can really change their their mindset and mm. also create a lot of self-discovery and mm. self-awareness okay that's important okay yeah. no that's interesting and let, let's just take this uh, back a couple of steps as well so obviously you've got your own sports psychology business in the zone um just tell me a little bit about that and some of the athletes that you work with because i know you work with athletes from various sports right whether mm -hmm. it be football boxing or or whatnot so just tell me a little bit about that yeah so um the athletes that i work with are from various sports mm. uh largely have been recently have been tennis and football mm -hmm. um recently also as well my clients are kind of spread into the business world as well that okay. are high performers um that are high performers or in organizations is that something you wanted to do or is it just slowly kind of uh kind of filtered into the business world oh, i think i've probably manifested it that's yeah, probably yeah. why it's happened also, is it something you wanted to do then <laughs> of course yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh. I'm someone that really wants to learn more and branch out my skills but this is one thing i thought about a lot when i watched a few of your videos and the advice that you give i was thinking probably in like when you talk about sports psychology a lot of that can be applied to oh, yeah. everyday life to business to be applied to anything like even for me i use kind of the struggles in sports and gym as kind of a metaphor for real life, right? So it's probably a smooth transition for you. Yeah, you'll be surprised. I've had clients that are not athletes and are not mm. in the business world and just actually want to um, have support and guidance with something that's holding them back. Okay. Like literally, yeah. and that's that's always been the case as well. So it's yeah. anybody that wants yeah. to strive yeah. um, to be the best really mm. or overcome something that they think okay. they can do. Yeah. Okay. So going back to your question, uh, mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so really honing into the athletes, I would mm. probably get athletes that will want to increase awareness of themselves. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Yeah. Facing adversity in the past, future and present. Mm -hmm. Athletes that want to maximise on their good days. Okay. So still want to be the best and how they can be better on the days that they actually are great. And What's the most difficult athlete you've had to um to work with with a sense of you can see they're really struggling with something and mm. is, is there anything that comes to mind whether it be anxiety that they have or yeah just being able to deal with the pressure i think the most difficult athlete i've had obviously no names <laughs> no, no. <laughs> has to be someone who finds it really hard to express and be open okay and this particular athlete 
found it really hard to express emotions to a tennis player mm -hmm. on the court. So they wouldn't express mm -hmm. any sort of emotions when they were winning or losing. It was just the same face. Is that is that good or bad though? Would you say? Because like there's a saying that you shouldn't get too high when things are going well, and you shouldn't get too low when things are going bad, and you should stay kind of. So w would you say that's a good thing or a bad thing? Because sounds like it's a bad thing. <laughs> well, for when when working with yeah. him in particular, it was almost like he was holding back his emotions okay. and not expressing them, yeah. which was a big part of not being mm. able to be in the flow yeah. when he's playing. Mm -hmm. And for me, my concern was it doesn't matter mm. how you kind of express those emotions, but I just want you mm. to know that these emotions to express mm. is okay and yeah, it's yeah. good for you. Okay. Then it's important because we want to get you into the state of being yeah. in flow. Mm. Um, and when you can do that is when you're relaxed and you've mm. got control. Yeah. So his background was all about, if you more about if I express this or express that, mm -hmm. I will get judged. Uh, okay, fear of judgment. I can imagine that's a big. I def fear I've definitely judge. been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fear uh, of judgment. Okay. It was judgment in what way for that particular? It was fear of if I if I win if I'm winning um what the others may think of me. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. if I'm losing, what the others may think of me too. Yeah. As well. Uh, okay. Um, if I'm winning, my opponent may think that mm. I'm now too excited. I'm too. I'm getting really happy about this. Might take mm. advantage, uh, and same with losing as mm. well. So it's almost like it's like a shield in a way. Really, yeah, like yeah. A defensive shield. And then him outside of tennis, when he started to work with me, he's never worked mm. with um, a psychologist before, mm -hmm. so he didn't understand what the sessions mm. were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And communication for him and openness was so unusual. Do, do you have to, in some ways? pick the person apart and <laughs> understand them at a really kind of basic human level why they think the way that they do do you even have to like understand their upbringing in some ways yes you do absolutely yes i really it's a skill set to have to hone into someone's world yeah. without looking through the lens of mine and mine experiences mm. it has to be solely about yeah, their yeah, yeah. their world putting my feet in their shoes and looking okay. through their lens only and seeing what that life yeah. is. Because I can imagine, obviously, with a lot of athletes that you work with, especially young athletes, like even in your 20s, you think of a lot of the way that they are and the way that their mind works. A lot of that will be down to their programming, through the way that they've been brought up, their family surroundings, what their parents' beliefs are and the way that you should yeah. do things. It's only kind of as you do get older, you begin to kind of grow into your own person right so yeah. is a lot of it understanding the person's upbringing as well and yeah. the way their mind works absolutely and you have to remember a young athlete growing up has a perception of what their parents have a perception of them yeah. or what the world has a perception mm. of them so really they don't really have a perception or they don't understand who they are mm. through themselves yeah they don't know actually who they are mm. um it's always been created by something around them yeah, yeah so with the younger athletes it's really with that we do a lot of self-discovery and self-awareness mm -hmm. and identifying who they are at yeah. a very young age you can if you start doing that it opens mm. up a lot more of who they are and what they want mm. i've got a 14 year old right now and she's great she's mm. um tennis player really really well and i think we've worked for about a year now mm -hmm. and just her identity of who she is yeah. has been a massive shift. And mm. she keeps telling me, I can't believe how much I've identified who I actually yeah, am. Yeah, yeah. To the point where she used to wear clothes, for example, mm. um, when she was competing. Mm -hmm. um, the brands that she used to wear were the brands that her tennis coach wears. Oh, okay. Right? And yeah, it was yeah. almost like, She's another version of yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and that's what it felt like. And yeah. now it's like she doesn't see herself in her anymore. She sees yeah. herself as she is. Uh, and now she's gone off and bought her brand and the clothes that she wants to yeah, wear yeah, and, yeah. and who she wants to wear. I think, if anything, that's what helps the confidence grow, right? <laughs> when you know you're comfortable in your own skin in a way and you're not trying to 
sometimes you don't even realize like if you're trying to impersonate somebody else right it's just oh that person looks good in that i'll, I'll wear that yeah. but really it's about trusting in, in your own self right being your own person i think sometimes at a young age that's very hard to um to kind of fathom in your mind right it's very difficult yeah it's very difficult and it's asking yourself those right questions mm. and being aware of it as well it's yeah. so hard i mean we've all been through it mm. there's things that you probably have asked yourself like where's yeah. that come from mm. why am i thinking like this yeah no definitely all the time and i think one of the things that you touched on i was going to touch on this a little bit later but as you have mentioned it i'll touch on it now fear of judgment i think that's a that's probably a a, a big one i think mm. a lot of people struggle with and including myself it's been a really big one as well because i like to tell people one of the main reasons i started this podcast was because i was awful at public speaking i thought you know what and i'd avoided it for so long and it was something that i have to do all the time obviously i work in the corporate world and i was required to present all the time in front of stakeholders and i absolutely dreaded it i'd avoid it at any cost even when it got to the point of me presenting i'd feel like my heart beating out my chest and honestly, I genuinely didn't think there was anyone who could get as nervous as I could. And I thought, how do I control this? Because I knew it was based on the way that my mind was programmed, yeah. that there was some kind of fear of judgment there about what other people are going to say or that I'll say something wrong, et cetera. But, um, and again, feel free to absolutely pick me apart here. I'm happy for you to do it. But w- why do you think that could be using me as a bit of a, <laughs> using me as a bit of an example as to why I get that kind of, fear yeah I'd, I'd say a bit of it is probably fear of judgment maybe perhaps right. i'm always thinking what's this person gonna think what's that person gonna think is it a case of me not being confident in what i'm actually going to say because mm-hmm. if i'm honest I feel like now i'm in a podcast area i feel a bit more comfortable than i would be in the corporate world do you think it's something to do with the world that i'm in there or well what is making you think about other people thinking about you Do you know what? If I'm honest, I've always been about health and fitness, right? For me, that's my go-to. That's what I specialise in in terms of I grew up kind of boxing since six years of age, played football, did all that. I think when it came to the academic side of things, mm. obviously I did the usual thing of going to university and um, obviously went into the working world, nine to five. Um, obviously, yeah, I work in the corporate world now. But maybe it's because I'm not fully invested in it i'm just working it out now as you've asked me the question (laughs) because i've never really asked myself it as maybe i should have maybe it's the fact that i'm not as invested in it as perhaps i should be maybe i'm not trusting myself as much in that in that world as i do in perhaps the area and the world of health and fitness Mm. i don't know yeah maybe that's something for me to Mm. to think about yeah but yeah it's always been one when it comes to public speaking a a, a bit yeah I mean, this is a fear of judgment or just the fact I get crazy nervous and mm. I know it's always something that I wanted to control. Where do you think it comes from? I think it is, I feel like it's definitely something that's built into me from when I was very young. Cause I always used to be a really shy, quiet kid. And that's initially why my dad put me into boxing. He wanted me to come out of my shower. And to be fair, when it came to boxing, I'd, without any difficulty performing in front of hundreds of thousands of people, uh, even if the whole room was against me, I'd still be able to perform. And I'd have that, like the whole kind of room booing me, like when I'm walking into a ring and I'd, if anything, I've thrived on it. So that's why I found it so difficult to think, okay, if I can do that, why is it when it comes to public speaking, you know, say a corporate environment, yeah. why do I get nervous in that environment? Obviously I can still do it, but yeah. it's not, I want to be able to enjoy it. Right. I don't want to be nervous thinking, what's this person going to say? What's that person thinking? Uh. So, yeah, I feel like it is something that's maybe ingrained in me mm. from, from a very young age. But. Would you say it's someone in particular that you think about the most? Let's see if I can bait anyone out <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> anyone in particular? Like, I had, like, my dad, who is he's definitely somebody I, I look up to. He was, he was a strict parent as well at the same time. Like, he wanted the best for me in, uh, in, ver- in various avenues, but... I don't know. I feel, I feel like there's something that must have happened while I was younger that it's just programmed me in a way to be worried about what other people right. are going to say and just to, without being able to speak openly. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, maybe it's something that I need to it, so delve into a little bit more, right? You, 
and we can we're yeah. gonna, we can dive into this a little yeah. bit more if you've got more time <laughs> yeah. we can dive deeper. i don't want to take this whole <laughs> podcast session up to be a, a, a client session just for me <laughs> but it could be that there's probably been a bad experience yeah, yeah, with yeah. this and you're rehearsing that more than the actual good mm-hmm. experiences in that and if i asked you what are the best best experiences yeah. you've had in presenting you're probably going to find that hard to find because you're honing into what's gone bad all the time how would you overcome that bad experience like if it let's say for example there has been a bad experience um that does come to mind and how would i get over that bad experience let's say if it's just ingrained deep rooted in the back of my head and it's causing me to have that fear of judgment or fear of speaking up how how would i overcome that do you think yeah so i'll probably ask you what that moment was and what when was that let's unpack it yeah yeah yeah. what was that bad experience because there's something that you're attaching you need to to. unlock it to yeah Yeah, yeah. you're attaching something to that bad experience and it's holding you back yeah and so what's happening is it's obviously Mm. been a big part in your brain it's it's caused that you hold it quite Mm. high and it's caused a lot of emotion negative emotions So you're rehearsing that moment again yeah. and again and again, and okay. it's not let you're not letting go of not it. Not letting go, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it is a case of like healing old wounds in a way, so to speak, that you've maybe held on to for maybe a bit too long. Or that's right. Or could we look at the best of you presenting? Okay. Yeah. What have been the best what? ones? Where yeah, you yeah, performed yeah. at the best? Yeah, where yeah. you was in the zone? You was in the flow? You never thought about what the people think mm-hmm. about you can we get you rehearsing that on a regular mm. basis okay. to create those negative emotions yeah, and yeah, yeah. i'm sorry to create the positive Posi- emotions <laughs> and yeah. the positive thoughts um another thing that i um think about when it comes to presenting is your focus okay so it seems like your focus is more again a little bit about what people are thinking about mm-hmm. you I like to use the idea of really honing into a person when you're mm-hmm. presenting and yeah. Okay. acting like as if you're talking one-to-one with them okay. even though you've got a room full of them yeah, right? yeah yeah and when you've got that connection with that one-to-one person yeah you are and that person's giving you a smile yeah yeah, really yeah. Hot, you're, it's just you and that person it gives you that, that confidence it does mm. but then everybody else is listening mm. as deeply as well because yeah. it feels like you're talking to yeah i'm just person. trying to put my and i don't want to just make this about just public speaking but yeah because <laughs> i'm just trying to think about the times i have presented straight away my thought process as I'm talking goes to what's everybody thinking about what I'm saying. Right. So like you said, that maybe that's a useful trick that I'll use going forward, just focusing on one person. Just pick that one person yeah, that yeah, you yeah. feel comfortable with and just yeah. eye to eye contact okay, no, that's interesting. with that yeah. person. And then you'll start seeing everybody else yeah, yeah, in that room okay. will body language will start to yeah, come yeah, yeah. a little bit. I'm gonna try that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, defi- I'll definitely give it a try. I'll let, I'll let you know how <laughs> let it goes. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about as well was visualization oh yeah and the reason why there was actually um obviously the euros again uh, just took place uh, a couple of weeks ago there was one incident um and it was when england played the netherlands and it was actually post-match uh ollie watkins the uh, center yeah. forward obviously scored the last minute goal the winner he did a post-match interview which a lot of people said um, oh he's just excited he's getting a bit of a uh, he's just a bit hyped up uh, with his uh, kind of comments post-match but I thought, no, it's actually not. What he actually said was, um, obviously, he'd been on the bench for quite a few games, as had one of his, uh, obviously, other, the other players on the England team, Carl Palmer. And I think he was getting a bit frustrated that he wasn't getting any game time. And I think in a training session, uh, he said in the post-match interview, he said, I said to Cole Palmer, we're going to come on as substitutes. Mm. He's like, you're going to pass me the ball. And he's like, I'm going to score. Mm. He's like, it's going to happen. He's like, trust me. He's like, I be-. And you could tell the way he was speaking in the post-match press conference. He believed it. He had true belief in it. And uh, funnily enough, Cole Palmer, they both came on as substitutes together. Mm-hmm. Cole Palmer passed him the ball and Ollie Watkins scored that last uh, last minute goal. And the intriguing thing that I found is you could tell in his celebration, the ecstasy in his, in his face that what he had just envisioned had just come true in such an amazing way. Uh, and then he, he'd essentially visualized it and brought it into, into reality. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was phenomenal because I'm somebody who's a big believer in visualisation, but is that one of the core things that you think are impo- important in an athlete reaching kind of the next level? Is it something that you teach? It's a big part of performance. And yes, yeah. to, that answer, uh, to that question, 
um, it's a strong image of rehearsing for future events. Mm. Um, you know, you've just given the example of Ollie Watkins, Ronaldo. I think recently in his interview, he mentioned about the night before. He knows that he's going to score the next mm. day because he's rehearsed that yeah. goal. Um, I use it quite a lot with my clients mm. and with my athletes. Um, with visualization, it is really being clear mm-hmm. with this visualization. Mm. Um, clearer it is, the more likely it is to happen, right? Right. And when I'm doing it with the athletes, with my athletes, they're like, "I don't. It hasn't happened yet. Mm. What's so why? What, mm. what are you trying to make me do here?" Yeah. And I'm like, "Look, listen. We're making up this story. We're making up this event that's mm. going to happen tomorrow in your match. Mm. You tell me what's going to happen. How would you want it to turn out to be? Mm. What's going to happen? Mm. What it's going to look like? What would you like it? To, what would mm. you like it to happen to be? What would you like the event to be?" How would you like the score to be? Mm. Come on, let's let's dive mm. deeper into this. And mm. we really, I really like dive into the in even into the bits of what they're gonna wear, mm. how they're gonna look like, uh, what court they're going to play on. Mm. Or You've got to commit to it fully. If you're gonna visualize, you need to know the specifics, right? And it's that it's that rehearsing that image mm. again and again and again for it to be almost like reality. Mm. And the next day, you know it's going to. There's another exercise that I do with the, um, athletes. Is a night before I tell them to think of an emotion or a feeling of how they mm. want tomorrow to feel, because okay. you're telling your unconscious mm-hmm. mind that's how you want to feel tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So with one of my athletes, just imagine that feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So one, one of my, she goes, she said to me, "I've never heard that exercise before." Mm. What? Yeah. I said, "Well, we're training the unconscious here. Yeah. This is unconscious mind. It doesn't have to be on the court when you're playing all the time." Yeah. It's, away from that okay when you go to bed think about a feeling that you yeah. want to feel tomorrow mm-hmm. and she was like i actually want to feel calm tomorrow yeah like, okay well say that let your brain just imagine what that feels say like that. yeah yeah imagine what that sometimes feels your like. brain doesn't know what's happening or what's imaginary right yeah that's so true and visualization is a it's a big part of performance it's this is why the it, it differentiates the individuals that are exceptional yeah, because if it, what the very first time that um, I used visualization, it was actually nothing to do with sport. I just used it in general life, and I can remember the the most amazing things in my life started to happen. I was like, "This can't be, um, this can't be true." How everything is unfolding. So I was like, "That I'd just keep using it," but I got complacent. I stopped yeah. visualizing as well as I had, and uh, even now lately. Um, I realized I wasn't quite reaching the targets that I wanted to reach uh, from a personal standpoint. I thought, what are those visuals that I am visualizing? And then what I realized was they were by nowhere near clear enough mm. kind of visualizations of kind of what it was that I wanted to be or where I wanted to be. They weren't specific enough, how you mm. said. They need to be kind of, the, mm. the clearer they are, the easier it will be to bring it into a reality, right? But you need to know exactly where it is that you want to be. And like you said, from a feeling standpoint, you need to know what that feeling is to be able to actually get to the Mm. point of feeling it. So if you can imagine it, you can bring it into reality. Do you think... Do you think in pictures or words? Pictures, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same as well. Oh, you're the same? Yeah, okay. a lot yeah. of it is. I think, yeah, definitely for me, it's right? in uh, it's in pictures. I mean, yeah. there's no right and wrong. Yeah. There's individuals that... Cause I, w- one thing that I do, you might have noticed, I do like a, a cold plunge every morning. Um, I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the funny thing is, I only started doing it from a physical standpoint with regards to my energy levels, my dopamine levels. It just went through the roof, and it just got me into a really good kind of productive mm. routine. But one thing that I started actually using it for was... Cause I, Thought, you know, how can I use my time better while I'm in the tub? Because mm. I'm just kind of sitting there. So one thing I thought was, okay, let me use it as a way to let me meditate and visualize. <laughs> and it, for me, it's become a really useful tool to visualize. And yeah, that was one thing I learned that a lot of the things that I was visualizing weren't specific mm. enough. And I think that's one thing you reiterated and it's hit home with me. Mm. Like, and one thing, yeah, I probably would start doing is feelings you want to feel in terms of the outcome mm. imagine what that feels like now right mm. and that and the reason why i asked you that is because some people learn a lot by images some mm-hmm. learn by writing a mm. lot um i i try to do this understanding my clients when you say writing do you mean like journaling and things like that like they 
think with words and they're very good at articulating their words okay. and they're very good at writing. Mm -hmm. They're very good at expressing that. Some ind individuals are very good like yourself and I just when we s see an event or mm -hmm. think of the future events, we see it with pictures mm -hmm. and we start yeah, yeah, creating yeah. the pictures. Yeah, I'm definitely like that. Right? Mm. And a lot of athletes are like that. They really are thinking from pictures. Mm -hmm. There will be some yeah, yeah, yeah. pictures. And the, the thing that you've got to be very careful about with visualization, if you start thinking mm. and building this picture up with negative emotions, mm -hmm. that is also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go and tell that knock I was effect, it, it works it? both ways, it right? It works both ways. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. <laughs> um, one of the other questions I had was, and I guess it's something that all people would, would love to have is. Um, some element of mental toughness. Mm. Is that something you can teach? Is it something, is mental toughness something you can develop mm. over time? Yeah, mental toughness is a skill that develops over time from your experience. And what would you say mental toughness is? It's something that, it's something that you do, not something that you have. Yeah. It's, mental toughness is... A form of resilience in a way, isn't it? Another word is fortitude. I mm. use that quite a lot. Yeah. It's facing your setbacks, adversities, mm. and dealing with that. But if you really want to hone deeper into this, I think vulnerability is an aspect mm -hmm. of mental toughness. Yeah. Right? Being comfortable with the vulnerability. Right. You think? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So a lot of the time is not expressing yourself, yeah. looking weak, dealing with the feelings of shame, guilt, but yeah, actually yeah. having the courage to overcome those yeah. feelings is a large part of becoming mentally tough mm -hmm. and fortitude with that. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't take risks or opportunities because of those feelings mm -hmm. associated with vulnerability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, was, I was think it's, it's a trait that everybody would, would love to have, right, mm. whether it be in sports or, or in everyday life. So if you were working with someone who wanted to develop mental toughness, how would you go about doing that in a way? Or is it something where they need to go through, um, like they say, everybody needs to fail, right? They need to go through difficult moments. Would you say it's a case of that, that people just need to experience those difficult moments in sport and in life to build that mental toughness? Yeah, sometimes you have to let that happen mm. for them to understand that. And when mm. that it could be work both ways. So mm. it could be not getting too hyped when you are winning mm. and not falling back when you're losing. Yeah. Right. And when those moments come, it's mm. really understanding mm. and unpicking, well, how are we going to bounce back okay. from these situations? Mm. So I think, yes, to letting them experience, but then talking about those experiences yeah, yeah, and yeah. changing that perception Yeah. for them to know that we have to be strong-minded, persistent and consistent to get to that desired outcome. Okay. Well, just on that, then, let, let, let's go back to you. What What would you say is maybe one of your most difficult experiences kind of growing up in the world of sport um, that you you found difficult to overcome, whether you did or didn't overcome it in the moment? I'm sure, obviously, you learn from mm -hmm. those things over time. Is there anything that springs to mind, whether it be tennis or, or something else? <laughs> So I, I guess tennis has been a big part mm. of the journey when I was younger and probably mm. early on in my senior years as mm. well. I think resilience is a big part of my strength mm -hmm. by overcoming. Um, I'd say the toughest challenge, it's a good question. Mm. I think the toughest challenge for me is when others don't believe in you. Okay. Mm. And I guess that's something that a lot of people have to deal with, right, in sport, because yeah. not everyone is going to believe in you. But I guess sometimes another kind of variable in that is who who is the person or who are the people who aren't believing in you? Is it somebody close? Is it somebody distant? So that was something that was a yeah. challenge for you. Yeah, and I think it's even harder when it's someone closer as yeah. well. And it's not they're not doing it intentionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's someone obviously they have mm. their mm. self belief and confidence yeah. conf like issues in themselves, but mm. I think and also their own perception of how mm. life should be and how it should be and what they want for you. But I think when you know 
what you want. Yeah. And you also yeah. know inside that you've mm. got the potential to do that, mm. which is incredible. And I think mm. that's a great place to start because you can mm. make so much mm. movement and so much with that. But it's yeah. very hard when the others don't see that. Yeah, it, it definitely is hard. I can see how it would even, because in some ways they're creeping elements of doubt into your mind, yeah. right? Which is what you don't need. And just speaking on that, I came across a fascinating video the other day. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Um, so obviously I know your background is tennis. It was a video of Serena Williams, I think when she was 14 years old, being interviewed by somebody. And I think obviously she must have been coming uh, into a very important matchup at that age. I think her dad was in the background of the interview and the interviewer asked her like, oh, do you think you're going to win? And I think Serena, I think it was Serena, not Venus. Um, she said, yeah, no, definitely. I, I'm, I'm going to win. I know it. She had like a smile on her face. Yeah. She was a you could tell she had such self-belief as a 14-year-old kid. But then the interviewer started digging. He's like, but why are you that confident? Why? Mm. And then her dad interrupted the interview. Mm. And I get why he did it now. When he said to the interview, he's like, what are you doing? He's mm. like, she's a 14-year-old girl. She's a happy-go-lucky 14-year-old girl who has immense self-belief in her ability. She's an innocent child who wants to yeah. perform well, do well. He's like... He's like, I'm telling you now, don't go down that avenue. Don't mm. dig into that hole. Mm. He's like, she doesn't need that. We don't need that. Obviously, somebody from, I feel like, an everyday person could have looked at him as Serena's dad and said, he's been a bit much, isn't he? Like, mm. why is he? But I can kind of see why he would mm. he would do that because as soon as you have, like, especially a kid, because your mind is a sponge at that age, right? And as soon as you start planting yeah. seeds and elements of doubt, it can play a big part, yeah. right? Because self-belief is a huge part yeah. of, of being a successful athlete, right? Yeah, I agree. It's a big it's a big part. It's one of the things... Is it a clip you've seen, that one? I've seen that one. Have you seen yeah, it? Yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah, it. yeah. I mean, her dad's awesome, isn't he? Yeah. He's, all, he's always kind of protected his daughters. Yeah, which I think was an awesome thing of him to do because I think a lot of parents probably wouldn't have even interjected at that point, mm. thinking that it wasn't a big deal. He's just asking yeah. a couple of questions. But if you really want to get to an elite level... I think he just has such protection over mm. her. He's like, no, you're not getting into her head yeah. like that. She's in the right mind Leave frame. It. You're not touching it kind yeah, of thing, which is an amazing thing yeah. when you think about it. But talking about that, yes, you will get that when you're younger as well. But when mm. you're older as well, like with opportunities, yeah. you know, there's like, there's been challenges that mm. I've had where I feel like I haven't got it because obviously they, they, I'm talking mm. to the wrong person firstly. Mm. If I always plead that if someone says no, we'll shut that door on yeah. you if you are talking to the wrong person. Mm. But then it's like, it does make you think like, they obviously don't believe in you. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. it takes time for people to see that as well. It, it's true. H how would you deal with that then? With it? Obviously, you could have such a belief in something, but mm. those closest around you, oh, I don't know whether you should be doing that or is it a case of, you just need to be so confident in yourself that you keep going for what you want or? I think it is that inner confidence, yeah. um, but also the courage. Mm. the courage. It would take a lot of courage, wouldn't it? I it think? would take a lot of courage, mm. yeah. It's just having the courage. Um, I saw it uh, as a, it was motivating, like mm. it was motivating me, it was yeah, driving me. Yeah, you can me. see it in those ways, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was like, right, okay, if yeah. that's the case, then <laughs> I'm going to win. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, no, as I've got older, that's definitely the same mindset I've started yeah. to adopt, whereas... And whether someone's like, well, why are you putting so much time into this or that? Or whether it even be the podcast, someone's saying to me, you really want to be spending that much time doing that? If, if I've got a vision and it's just something I can envision and I've got complete confidence in it and myself, it's one of those, I'll show you. I'll show you what I can do kind of thing, right? And and that, that's right. And using like, it in the right way. That's it. And I see it as a little bit of a playing a match, winning yeah. and losing here. Because mm. in life, you come across challenges. People will come, situations mm. and experiences. Mm will come and they're all challenges to make you lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I explained this to one of my closest friends and I said, yeah. these are all challenges to, it's testing you to lose, but you're yeah. not going to lose. I mm. don't want you losing. Yeah. You're not my friend otherwise. Mm. We, we're going to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to overcome this situation and win. That's, that's how we're going to see life and that's how we're going to move forwards. That's the only way to move forwards. Losing doesn't make you, uh, well, it, what I'm trying to say here is losing gives you information to move forwards. Mm. You learn from that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't want you to fall back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to learn from it every time, right? Yeah. I want mm. that strong, persistent, consistent mindset. Mm. 
of I'm going to overcome this challenge and mm. win yeah. because it's testing me. That person mm. is testing me. Mm. See it like that. Yeah. I, I think that's a perfect way to look at it, I think, because, yeah, I think in not just in sport but in life, you're always going to be faced with setbacks and people always. doubting you. Yeah. You can either crumble with it or you, and you can accept what that person's saying or you can take it as a challenge. And even myself, I now try not to take comments like that seriously and I try and treat it as a bit of a game. Okay, let, let me show you. I'll show you what I can do kind of thing. And so I think sometimes, like you said, like whether it be pressure or something else, if you, if you don't handle it in the right way, you will let it eat you up to yeah. a certain extent, right? So, yeah, no, I like adopting that type of mindset. I'll, I'll show you what I can do. What do you think has made you become mentally tougher? Oh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. What's made me mentally tougher? Do you know what? I think getting to know my own, my own mind in a way and challenging my own mind through whether it be physical challenges, mental challenges. I think I only became fascinated by the mind probably over the last few years, I'd say. And you might have even seen, um, I, I did like a bit of a challenge, which was the four miles every four hours. Love that. For some reason, I, I, it was a David Goggins challenge. I saw it and I was saying to my other half, I just can't get this challenge out of my head. I don't know what it is. I feel like it would take me to a bit of a breaking point. So I've never, ever been a... I had to road run a lot for, for boxing, yeah. but I'd never been like a amazing road runner hitting like a record or anything like that. And yeah, I just felt it was something that would break me physically, but mentally as mm. well with the lack of sleep and uh, the constant stop starting. So just little things like that. I thought, okay, if I can do this, I know I'm going to learn a lot more about myself, which I definitely did on that run. Because one other thing I did on that run was didn't have any headphones. I just right. like... I like kind of hearing my own thoughts while I'm running. So all you're then left, I think just in life, you're left with your own thoughts, right? So I was like, I want to do the whole 48 miles wow. just without any headphones, which I did. And there was a, the craziest thoughts that would go through through your mind, like, why am I doing this? Uh, I could just stop now, go home, no one would know. Um, but it was a case of, okay, if I stop now, I'll stop in life when I'm about to achieve something. And I think using those little things as metaphors yes. for life is what's probably slowly built my mental toughness, mm. I'd say. And even like with the ice baths and stuff, like it wasn't me trying to show off for anybody or anything like that. It was a case of, I found it really difficult um, to actually get in and do it, but I felt amazing afterwards. And I just knew it was something that would benefit me in the long term, but I'd have to suffer for it in the short term mm -hmm. for actually getting up on the cold mornings and, and getting in. So I thought you know, little things like that have slowly developed my mental toughness. And yeah, even now I'm just searching for little things that I can do. So I feel like a lot of it is just learning about your own mind, what it can handle, what it can't, and how far do you want to push it. It sounds like you're someone that likes to get out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself to become stronger, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And I, obviously I've just turned, well, I'm not, I'm 31 now. And I think it's probably hit me now more <laughs> so. That I'm like, okay, do you know what? I need to, like when it comes to the physical side of things, they say, obviously it's different in all sports, but as you get into your 30s, uh, that's when you're starting to get into your peak. And I'm like, okay, I need to do from a physical aspect, yeah. everything that I can now while I still can. And yeah, I'm just quite uh, precious about time and I don't want to waste it. How do you feel now mentally by doing those challenges? I feel like I'm a, honestly a different person now Love that. to when I was, I say even a year ago, but to three years ago, I was Amazing. a completely different person. And it has taken a lot of time, not saying I'm by any, by any means perfect, I'll still make mistakes and whatnot, but I feel like I'm learning about myself a lot more. And one of the other things that I implemented that I want to talk to you about as well is... Um, I can't, can't even remember where I saw it. There was a, uh, a book or something that I was... I'm pretty sure it was something that I was watched. I'm not a big reader. Um, but it was about implementing core values right. as a person mm. um, or maybe even as an athlete, you mm. could say. Um, so I did that. I thought, okay, let me implement some core values for myself as a person. Mm. And I was like, Jesus Christ, as soon as I implemented those values, I felt like it gave me such a direction mm. in life in terms of where I wanted to be mm. as a person and the things that and the goals that I wanted to achieve because what I realized as soon as I set those goals I thought I'm doing so many of the wrong things um that aren't aligned with the goals 
and the targets that I've set for myself. And it was such a huge wake up call. And don't get me wrong, there may even be times now where I'll slip up and I'll do something that is out of character, or yeah. out of alignment to my core values. Uh, but then I'll self reflect. I'm like, okay, why did I do that? Mm. How can I stop myself from doing that again? But yeah, would you say that's a big part of sports psychology as well, implementing core values? And massively, because it creates um, a lot of clarity like mm. you have and you are knowing what kind of person that you're becoming. And mm. it sounds like you want to be a good person. You know, you want to stick closer to your values. Yeah, I, I, I think in a way, because I think that's what, I, if I'm completely honest, I don't think I was proud of the person that I used to be, but I never knew why, because I never yeah. had structure, guidance or... Yeah something to follow but then when i mapped it out and i was like this is the person i want to be it. you're doing a lot of the wrong things if that's the person you want to be so like it could be something as small as um oh all the mates they want to go out uh, on the weekend uh they want to go out, have a few drinks uh, and i could have a say for example a podcast scheduled mm. the next morning i think me four or five years ago would have been like oh yeah i'll, I'll squeeze that in a few drinks with the other no because that's detracting from not saying I'm turning into a monk or anything, but that's detracting from my goals and where I want to be in life. And yes. that's not appropriate for me to do that. That, But maybe another time I can sensibly do that. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely given me more direction. It, it's it's definitely clarity. Mm. It gives you direction. Um, it, it gives you also an understanding of your identity mm. as well. When it comes to values, there is a lot of values out there mm. and it's understanding, well, what are my priority values here mm. and what are the most important values yeah, yeah, yeah. first of all and, and working with that. But I think the key thing here is what does that value actually mean? What's mm. the action to that value? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you can have a value of you know humility, integrity. Mm. But what does that actually what does it mean? Yeah. What does it actually look like? I'm right. going to dig into my own values <laughs> afterwards a little bit. Just, just ask myself why I chose them. But yeah, no, that's Do interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can have values like, these are five key values, six key mm. values, you know? Mm. But when you go into that environment, let's say, or, in, or when you're with those people and they say mm. these are values, but what do they actually look like? You know, that's what I would be... Yeah. That's what I do. You use a lot of these. Obviously, there must be tons of strategies and yeah. kind of frameworks that you use. Do you implement them on yourself as well? Oh, massively. Yeah. I'm a very much of a practice what I preach. I, I like need that. to experience yeah. these mm. myself to understand mm. how I can put these to other to, mm. to my clients. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Even with sports, when boxes, right? How did you find venturing into that world? I see it as like being in the army without weapons. Okay, it's interesting. Right, it's survival mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, you're, and you're protecting yourself all the time. Yeah. You are, li like you are in the army, yeah. like soldiers, you are treated in a way that you cannot be weak. Yeah. You cannot be making me feel, or anyone else mm. feel, mm. shameful or embarrassed. Mm. Yeah. And you have to be mentally <laughs> yeah, yeah. tough. It's very <laughs> ma macho. Like, I even think of my, my old coaches and the way we used to train. It was very ar army regimented. Right. With the way the training was, yeah. Because I understand that it's the characteristics of the mm. sport. Yeah. Um, when I went, when I started to work with boxing, I actually went to go and learn mm. a little bit of boxing myself and understand oh, awesome. it because yeah, I yeah. needed to understand it. Also, did you like. do that because you t uh, took on some um, boxing? boxing? Oh, okay, yeah. so you really invested yourself into it. Okay. I did, yeah. I'm not, yeah. Uh, I'm not great at that sport. Yeah, but no, I admire <laughs> that, that you actually took the time to actually really get into the, the mindset of, of a boxer. It's just... Exactly. It's just yeah. understanding that you are going to get punched in the face. Yeah, yeah. It's just normal. And you have to start to like it in, in a way, <laughs> weird way as well. But that was one of my questions because I was like, obviously, you work with ath athletes from various backgrounds. Yeah. How do you get into the mindset? But it's good that obviously you actually partook even in uh, yeah. a bit of boxing as well. But yeah, well, what else did you think about the sport? And uh, I think with boxing was, uh, like I said, it's a, you get treated in a way where you it's negative reinforcement it's mm. all about that punishment it's all about mm. we don't want to be feeling vulnerable mm -hmm. well vulnerable is seen as weak yeah, yeah, yeah more than as as courageous um with boxing they have a huge part of marketing mm -hmm. aspect to them as well so they yeah. have this sort of boxing identity and then mm. their own identity mm. and when i worked with boxers um, and who they portray themselves as boxers is actually not them they're actually so much more softer they've got a, mm. a life that is just like everybody else is, yeah. um, I do believe, and from my experiences, that their life 
growing up has been obviously traumatic. A lot mm. of their experiences growing yeah. up have had traumatic experiences. Mm. Um, they also deal with a lot of injuries, head injuries that mm. have been reoccurred or yeah. in the past as well. Um, but because of the style of coaching and training that they've mm. had for a long amount of time has detrimented their mental health uh, a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um, so do you think it can be, um, in some ways, has a negative impact on kind of general mental health for a boxer? Yeah, for a long time. In, 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 in what ways, though, would you like say? They can get I'm interested. Yeah, in like, I feel like... I'm, I probably might agree with you as well. Yeah, I fair. feel like that... I'm not saying that the coaching isn't great. The coaching's great, and the people around them are obviously got in good intentions, yeah. and they want them to win. And, and because the characteristic of the sport, like I just yeah. mentioned to you, is about survival mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's more negative reinforcement than positive reinforcement. Mm-hmm. They get the outcome, but then the player's mental health and well-being is gets dismissed. Mm. They lack empathy. Yeah, it's definitely a, a sport that has no empathy. Yeah. Lacks empathy Without so doubt. much. Lack of openness. Yeah. Lack of who they want to become. But where did you see that? Like, what what made you think that? Just in is my it is it from communicating with the boxers you're working with? Yes, and then obviously there's some of the team members. Okay. Did you well. see how they operated in the gym and? Yeah. yeah absolutely. Ah, okay. And I st- and I and I believe that you can still get the outcome of an individual, but you can still do it in a positive reinforcement way. But the Mental health and well-being yeah. will be intact much better. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. It's, it's a huge part because I think a massive part of boxing is the mental side of the game. It is, yeah. And the reason I was so interested in that was I think I was probably about 17, yeah, about 17 years old. I think I had reached a national final and I was really pushing to try and uh, win the nationals. And obviously, like I said, putting a lot of pressure on myself, as I mentioned earlier, to the point where I probably stopped enjoying the sport because mm. for me it became very results driven mm. it was no, it was no longer about enjoying it or enjoying the training i remember i got to a point i was yeah i was probably about 17 years of old 17 years of age and for some reason i became very down in the dumps and i didn't know why i was struggling like going to the gym getting mo- getting motivated i was struggling to perform and i'd kind of feel quite upset a lot of the time mm. i didn't know what it was and I think a lot of it came from the sense of put, putting too much pressure on myself. And mentally, I was really struggling, mm. but I was not speaking to anyone. I think people like the only person that noticed was my dad. A couple of times he asked me if I was OK. Um, but I just thought, yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm good. But I was really struggling mentally. I, I think do you know what a big part of it was. So I think and this is very true in boxing. It's a very lonely sport. It is. And yeah. a lot of the time I was traveling to and from the gym. I was at college at the time. So I was spending probably about 90% of the time on my own. And uh, I think eventually um, my coach obviously probably noticed it, took me to the side, said, what's up? And it, my coach was phenomenal. Great coach when it came to the technical teachings of boxing. But he was an old coach. He was old school. And uh, he's still coaching now to this day. And, like, he took me into a room and he said, what's going on? And I just goes, I told him I was like, I'm struggling. I was like, I'm not sure what's wrong with me, but I'm just really struggling to get myself motivated. I felt like there was a lot more I wanted to say, yeah. but I couldn't say it. Yeah. And then the only advice I got back was, well, you've got to get yourself motivated. It's the In some ways, it's cutthroat. It, it was right. It was, you have to find a way. But and I think different boxers would react differently. Some would be like, okay, I just need to, f-, and they would maybe yeah. take it well. But I think maybe somebody like me needed an arm around me yeah, to say, listen, what's up? Yeah. Maybe it's dependent on the person. But yeah, it's a very cutthroat oh, sport yeah. where I think you've got to have just a very, very, as we spoke about mental toughness, you need to have a hell of a lot of it, I think, to go far in the sport. It is that, and yeah. I totally agree. And there is personality differences yeah. here too. But another thing with boxing is they they dismiss having extra support. It's yeah. Like when you go and see a performance psychologist, it's seen as a weak yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. and you don't want anyone else to know about mm. it or gaining any other kind of support mm. in that area is like, oh, no, yeah. I can't do that, and I can't do this. Because it's like you've... The perception of being mentally tough is being like a lone wolf yeah, yeah, yeah. and being able to go through the criticism, yeah. go through all this yeah, yeah, yeah. negative reinforcement that I'm getting. I don't want to be looking like yeah. a weak. I don't want to be looking shameful, mm-hmm. embarrassed. And 
it just creates, like you said, that lonely mm. world. Um, but it's not great. It's not. It's not. Or do you know what's crazy? I don't know why they don't. The stuff that you're teaching people, why they don't teach you this at such a younger age? Because mm. I'm so annoyed with myself when I look back. I'm like, oh, if only you just knew some of the things you knew now <laughs> back then. I was like, it would have made <laughs> things so much easier. But no, don't get annoyed. I think that's something yeah. that you can learn from and experience now there's, yeah there's potential Life to experience right. you're really young so but um a- another thing you mentioned a couple of times is um goal setting mm. as well that's got again as part of the whole <clears throat> kind of having direction in terms of what you want to achieve right yeah and i think with goal setting it's really important to be processed mm. so i call it performance goals mm. um and when you're going onto the pitch or going into the ring or onto the court, it's about setting process mm-hmm. orientated goals and not the goal of winning. Yeah. So one of my footballers, um, before his match, we would list three goals mm-hmm. and he would just send it me, you know, today I'm tomorrow I'm gonna mm-hmm. be doing this, this and this. And oh, it was just okay. simple. Yeah. It was just simple things like, you know, um, one of my uh, aims will be to make sure that I pass to every single player. Okay, yeah. that's one. The second will be I'll make sure I run forwards every single time yeah and then one of them would be um i'm going to score one goal and mm-hmm. it was just very simple mm-hmm. no more than three no more than three sometimes it was two sometimes it was just one mm-hmm. you don't want too many goals you mm-hmm. want it to be clear simple yeah yeah, yeah. and realistic and as believable well. as well you have the self-belief yeah. in it yeah Unbelievable. yeah yeah th- did i see that you're working with um salford yes team, yes which is famously known as uh, owned by is it Gary Neville, Paul <laughs> Scholes. Yeah. So what, what type of work do you work with various footballers within? I work um, with their academy side. Academy side. Yeah. Club, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was def- it's a club that's... Uh, developing. Developing Growing, at a rapid yeah. pace, right? That's so right, it's, yeah. Some exciting times there. That's it. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, interesting stuff. So obviously one thing that you probably um, commonly come across is football not just footballers, injuries oh, yeah. um, that athletes um, suffer. How do you help them overcome that and how much of that is mental? So a lot of it yeah. is mental, I'd say, with it because um, a lot of it, well, the first stage is accepting. Mm. And I think a lot of athletes don't accept that they're injured and they mm. carry on playing and they ignore the yeah, fact... that's me, 100%. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> and they ignore the fact yeah. that they're physically yeah. not at their best state. Okay. So there's a lot of acceptance work that needs to be done. There's a lot of realizing that you are in a field that re- mm. that is um, that does require injuries, and that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it's also shifting that mindset of right, okay, mm. I've got this injury now. I need to change my routine mm-hmm. here, change my focus here, mm-hmm. and work on getting the best, mm-hmm. becoming the best I can from yeah, this yeah, injury. Yeah. And I always say. It's, you are training to obviously become better and mm-hmm. from your injury, but train to become injury free, injury like in, free. but also injury prevention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more than just becoming free from injury. It's knowing that I don't want that feeling mm. again. I don't want to be in that situation again. Yeah, that's the kind of mindset you want to yeah. be in. When I, t- I tend to it's not just a short term, right? It's yeah. The, yeah, I tend to use um, Mo Salah quite a lot. An example okay. or Ramos, yeah, you know, when they had their injuries, Ramos from Madrid, so is your Ramos, Ramos yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, he's yeah. had a few injuries, hasn't yeah, he? yeah, he's had yeah. a few injuries, but yeah. their, their mentality was, I don't want to experience that again, yeah, that's not coming again, yeah. I've seen that's I've seen point. Ramos in with his re, he's an elite trainer, isn't he? I think he's an elite athlete, and you can tell by the way he trains he's, as well, yeah, serious discipline, yeah. serious commitment, no, uh, definitely. Yeah. So, what would be and I think this is something that um, listeners would be very intrigued to hear. If you're somebody who who's an athlete and you're struggling to get to that next level, what are the top three tips mm. that you would give somebody if they're just maybe from a, whether it's a, a mental standpoint, they're struggling to get to that next level. What what would be the top three tips or top three strategies that you would get them to use? Oh, top three. Okay, so the first thing that comes to me initially, I would mm. like to know what's holding you back. Yeah getting into the next level mm-hmm. what is holding you back yeah um and then let's unpack that first and overcome that first yeah and that's that's where i'd go first yeah so i wouldn't 
I wouldn't base it on one, two, three. I'd base it on one. Oh, okay. okay. I guess that's a lot of sports <laughs> psychology, though, right? You've got to um, get to the root cause of things first, understand, yeah, that mental programming in a way, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And the second thing, well, if you want to go one, two, three, the second thing is, well, you can get to the next level. Yeah. It's possible. Um, let's look at all the ways that's holding you back again. I think it's back to yeah. that same question again. What's yeah. holding you back more than anything else? And then what is the next level? Yeah. What is that for you? Mm, and what does why? that look like? And why? Yeah. There's got to be purpose attached to, to that. what you want to achieve, what right? Is it? Yeah. Let's get some clarity on that first. Okay. So it's a purpose. Yeah, like you said. Is that what a kind of initial session would look like when you're working with somebody is just unpacking at first and understanding? Yeah. And why that next level is important to them? Do, what do, that looks like. do you find when um, you're working with an athlete that, again, I, I guess there's a big difference with if you're approaching an athlete to work with them and them approaching you, because you need the investment from their side as well, right? If they're not fully invested in believing in what you're telling them, they're probably not really going to mm. follow through with those kind of psychological steps that they need to take, right? They mm. need to be invested in it, I assume. Oh, yeah. Definitely, mm. I love when I get athletes that want to grow, develop. Do you, ha do you ever have athletes where you think they're not really committing themselves to the process? Have you had that? Yes, I've had. Um, and they come from the basis of what their coach has informed them. Yeah. That they need that or their parents have. Yeah. Um, and that becomes difficult because they're not really invested into that. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm, I'm still there thinking, right, I still need to change. I mm, still need to work okay. with them. So even that little bit, yeah, change is a big thing for me. Okay, with character. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I know we're coming to the end of the podcast. Time is absolutely flying by, but let's <laughs> just talk a little bit about um, in the zone. Obviously, what you're working on at the moment. What What are the next steps for you? I know you said you're considering venturing out into uh, the business world now as well. Yeah. Um, so, so what are kind of some of those next steps? Where do you want to take this? Um. I think um, it's probably obviously still growing in the world of sports mm. and, like I said, going into the venture of business. Um, I, from my learning standpoint, would be to hone into intuition, your mm. unconscious and your conscious mind mm. at particular moments in the game. And that's what I would like to go and mm. dive deep and learn and do some research. Are, th are there certain things that, obviously, I know you've got a big academic background when it comes to sports psychology, but are there a lot of things where were less so able to be taught them, but you had to really experience them. And like you said, whether it be kind of working with clients from a particular, really getting into the mindset of those athletes, because I can imagine how it would be from an academic mm. standpoint, but practically putting certain things into practice. How has that worked for you? Yeah, like, I think, honestly, massively has come from applying it to myself. Yeah, I, like I using yourself as a bit of a... a massive, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and... Um, I love trial and erroring things in myself when it comes to like psychology. And also, like yeah. I, I think when I ventured out into this field, I've mm. always wanted to be around the best psychologists mm. to, to be to, to mm. be the best, really. Yeah. Um, and learning from them hasn't been really textbook stuff. It has been from their experiences of knowing what gets the player to be at their best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why I wanted to hone into the intuition bit, which yeah. ne I've never been taught that in my yeah, academic okay. years. Um, it's always been like the strategies. Yeah. No one's ever d dived deeper into the conscious, the unconscious. Mm. And, um, even like the core elements of mental health, mm. that's something that I had to work on myself as well um, and apply it with others. Yeah, it seems like such a fascinating area to go into because obviously, like you said, there's things that you can be taught, but when it's the mind, it's unlimited, right? Oh, yeah. There's so many the so things that you, you'll never stop learning, right? And I guess in a way, the fun part can be kind of trialing stuff on yourself and how it works and how it doesn't work and and whatnot. But mm. no, that's, uh, that's interesting. But mm, I, totally yeah. take, I totally agree. Yeah, so some busy uh some busy months ahead for uh for you then i'm looking forward to it but not considering yeah. dipping back into uh into the tennis or anything like that i mean i still play i still you play. Still play i still play I, st I play for my league and my club ah, awesome. i play okay. socially i, I you yeah. can't get the competitiveness out of me yeah i've even started dancing again so oh, like wow. okay, it's, it's nice. never gonna stop <laughs> was there ever a sense of you wish you could have took the 
the tennis further, like going fully into the kind of professional space? Or are you glad you took it to the level that you did? Because I know you took it pretty serious. No, looking back at it now, I think I'm glad where I've took it to where it mm. has. Um, because my purpose was, I remember when I was playing as a senior, mm. it was like, well, what is actually my purpose here? Mm. What do I really get that fulfillment out? Yes, I get yeah. happiness out of yeah, yeah, yeah. competing and, and winning mm. and so on. But what's the fulfillment? Yeah. And it really was helping others to win. I uh, love winning. Okay. And it was right. But I get the fulfillment from helping others to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I wouldn't. I, d I don't think there can be anything more fulfilling than helping other people, right? It's so rewarding. And if you can find a job that does that, yes. I think, yeah, I, c I can see where you're coming from with that. Because like even myself, I did a little bit of coaching in the amateur boxing you space. Think, yeah. And yeah, it's so fulfilling when you see kids who come into the gym with such little confidence. Yeah. But then you see them grow and evolve over time. So, yeah, no, I think that's amazing work that you're doing. And being able to work with people from all different types of backgrounds and whatnot. Right, so I think we're coming to uh, the end of the podcast now, but um, Melissa, how can people find out a little bit more about In The Zone, find out a little bit about you and what you do on the sports psychology front? I know you're on social media now. Yes, so. yes, I am on Instagram. That's yeah. Melissa Dillon at ITZ. Mm -hmm. Also on LinkedIn, that's Athletes In The Zone mm -hmm. page there. Um also have the website which is athletes in the zone .com. Okay. we just launched a new newsletter as mm -hmm. well so if you want to sign up to the newsletter which is a monthly um email that is includes uh confirmation for the video mm -hmm. and a, a way to overcome a topic okay. in that in that email as well so yeah oh, cool well, i'm sure you're gonna blow up on the social media <laughs> front very quickly because you've only just launched on uh, have, instagram yeah. and whatnot so now i'm excited I'm enjoying uh, with what's to come in that space um but yeah thank you for watching everyone um don't forget to follow melissa myself um in the zone and yeah thank you for watching if you've made it this far thank you very much